Kerr, the film critic for the Conway Daily Sun, and I'm joined by... Rob Clark, film uh, buff, I guess you'd say. That's why yeah. we're here. <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk about each of our uh, ten favorite films, not best films of the year. We're talking no. about our favorite films of the year. Uh, and so we got a lot to get through, so let's just jump right in. Uh, but your number 10 is actually not a number 10. No, it's, it's I, I, I started off a little funky um, because I have four, mo actually five movies in my number 10 that are actually not my favorite movies, but they are probably on many, many people's favorite movie list. So uh, we've got a graphic here, I think, for it. And people might be surprised, they're like, well, what's in your top nine then? if these four are in uh, that. The Holdovers, Paul Giamatti was great. The person who played the, the young kid, great. I think overall it just was a flat movie. Okay. Um, the uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, loved the second half of the movie. Basically, as soon as Jesse Plemons showed up, fabulous movie. Overall, just long and drawn out. Robert yeah. De Niro was, was great. Uh, in that one. American Fiction should have been phenomenal. The preview looked hysterical. If they had focused, it's basically kind of three movies, I think, three different stories. I've heard that, yeah, because I haven't watched it yet. If you focused on one of the stories, it would have been, it would have been top notch. It got bogged down by other stuff. Yeah. Um, and then Oppenheimer, you know, great movie, enjoyed it when I watched it. It's just so big and grandiose and you know, what's going on, you know, how do you follow those things? Yeah. Um, and then the fifth one that is also, uh, should have been there is Poor Things. Yeah. Um, I couldn't get through it. I'm gonna try it again. I just couldn't get through it. Yeah, uh, and I actually had some of those movies floating kind of just below my 10. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and one of them actually is pretty high on my list. I won't say what. Yet. No, that's fair, that's uh, fair, so. But I, I understand what you're saying uh, because some of those films, like Oppenheimer, like I actually really did like it. I liked the way it was structured. Um, but it's also one of those things like, how many times am I going to watch it? And I feel like <laughs> a favorite movie has got to be one that you want to go back to I, over and over I again. I agree with you 100%. Uh, so my number 10 is uh, a movie called Strays, uh, which is a R-rated talking dog oh, movie. I remember that, yeah. And it's uh, Will Ferrell is uh, the main talking dog, and he gets abandoned in the city by his terrible owner, played by Will Forte. And then he, he hooks, hooks up with another group of strays, and uh, they decide that they're going to get revenge on his owner. I'm just going <laughs> to leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like this is a great movie, but there is one scene in this movie that had me laughing harder than anything else in this year. Wow. Like to the point where my chest was hurting <laughs> hours later. That's so, funny. So for that reason alone... I had to include it. Well, and that's that's what a best movie list should be. It doesn't, you know, it's that whole thing, you know, of, oh, this is a great movie, it's grand. Yeah, but is it something that you enjoy? Right. And, and that, to, to me, is what a movie should be. Right, and to have such a, a visceral reaction, like, I couldn't stop laughing. We had to stop the movie. <laughs> that's what, all right, I gotta, that's not gonna be yeah. on my list, so. Is it my turn now? Yes. So my number 10 movie was one I actually just saw a couple weeks ago. Uh, on streaming called The Killer, which is a Ma Michael Fassbender movie. Oh, yeah, I, I missed and that one. And basically, he's an assassin who makes a mistake. Yeah. And then just what happens. And it's great because it's kind of subtle. It's not, it's not, there's action, but it's not just constant action, action, And that's a action. Fincher movie, right? Um, maybe. Is it a David yeah. Fincher? I, yeah. I, I thought could, yeah, it was. Could, yeah, I think it is. Okay. And it's smart. And it's one of, the, but it's not so smart that you're confused. It's, yeah. You know, so, and Michael Fassbender is just great. Yeah. He's great in, you know, almost anything he does. So that, that uh, made it to my list of top 10. All right. Yeah, no, that was, and this is the thing. There's so many movies come out, especially with all these streaming 18, services. 18,198 movies were released according to IMDb last year. That's crazy. And it's because there's all these streaming right. services, and so it's so hard to keep up. So that was one that came, and I was like, oh, yeah, I got to watch that. But then, <laughs> then 10, 10, two, other, 10 million other things yeah, came out. A week out. later, it's like, I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. But, yeah, I'll have to put that one back on my list. Uh, so my number nine is Renfield. Missed it, again, yeah. for the same reason. And this was a movie, uh, when I saw the trailer for, I thought this was going to be a big hit, because it was actually released in theaters. Right. And it came, and it just went. And it's, in this, Renfield is, it's kind of that, when he eats bugs, he basically gets superpowers, super strength. Oh, interesting. And so, it's supposed to be for him to help Dracula feed, but... He kind of at some point just gets tired of it, and he starts using it for good and trying to get away from him. And it's Nicolas Cage's Dracula. Yeah. And it's everything you want 
from Nicolas Cage playing <laughs> Dracula. It's over the top, it's, it's weird, he, it's just Nicolas Cage as Dracula. It's what you want. Right. And it also, oddly, even though it's this very funny and gory movie, it's an allegory for getting out of a toxic relationship and a codependent relationship. And to use Dracula and Renfield as that is, it's one, it's very smart, but yeah. it's not something you'd ever really think about. And it's really well done. Oh, that's great. Well, Nicolas Cage is at the point now where, you know, he, it's not like he's not trying to act, but he knows who he is. Yes. So play it up. The one um, uh, that came out a year ago, I'm drawing a blank on the name, where he played himself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unbelievably funny because he's playing Nicolas Cage. So yeah. embrace and, that. And so. he said that his Dracula was inspired by uh, his father. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So that's on my list. I got to yeah. watch that. So this is great. Um, my number eight was uh, No Hard Feelings with Jennifer Lawrence oh, yeah. and uh, Andrew Barth Feldman. You know, a clever movie. Um, it could have been. It could have been so horrible. Yeah. Um, but it's just played up. She is great. He is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and the storyline works. You know where it's going. Uh, well, the, actually, you don't go know exactly where it's going. You kind of know where it's going. Um, but it's just. It's fun. It takes place in. You know, in a summer resort. You know, in the Hamptons. Um, and it. It was just. It was just enjoyable and. You know, not overtly, you know, not a lot of swearing, not a lot of sex, not, you know, so just kind of an enjoyable movie yeah, and, it's, and funny and some really, you know, laugh out loud funny Yeah, and it's a, funny just moment. a good R-rated comedy, which we're not really getting a lot of, like, right. good R-rated comedies. Uh, and that kid you mentioned, uh, he, apparently he had a, a, a start in Broadway. And so there's this one moment where he sings like this ballad version of Man Eater. Yes. And it's like, wow, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And that's a great scene. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, a lot of pathos, I guess. Yeah. That scene. And it comes out of nowhere because you, it yeah. is this movie where it, it is very like raunchy and funny. And all of a sudden, this is like, it's kind of like this gut punch. You're like, oh, this is like, I'm getting kind of emotional here. Yeah. This is really good. No, I, I enjoyed that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my number eight is uh, Asteroid City. Uh, I'm a big Wes Anderson fan, and this is kind of leaning into all of his quirks and idiosyncratic style, because he's a very stylized filmmaker. Uh, yeah. Uh, and some people say that that kind of can push people away a little bit. And this, he kind of just leans into it. It might make the movie even more esoteric, but uh, what I liked about it is that it kind of plays with the, the artifice of theater and film and reality. Because at, at times it's a theater, a theatrical production, and then it's a film production, and then there's like behind the scenes, and it's all kind of happening at the same time. And then it kind of becomes an allegory for, for life itself. Oh, cool. Uh, and it's also very funny. And if you're in that wavelength, if you're in the wa Wes Anderson wavelength, yep. it's very funny. It's dry and deadpan. Tom Hanks is in it. Steve Carell is in it. Uh, Brian Cranston is kind of this uh, Rod Sterling-esque narrator who pops up throughout the movie. At one point, uh, the the camera like pulls over and he's like, "Oh wait, I'm not supposed to be here." <laughs> he disappears. Yeah, it's been on. It, that's another one on my list. But again, you know, and I, you know, when it came out, I'm like, "Yep, yeah, I gotta watch it. I gotta watch it." You know, and yeah. it, it fades away, and you forget about these things. I have my IMDb watch list, which is like 500 movies, because I think of it and I put it on there. And then when I'm scrolling through it to watch a movie, I'm like, nah, I don't feel like that one. No, I don't feel like that one tonight. Yeah. And it's all based on mood, but that's one that, because uh, uh, I love, was it Grand Budapest Hotel? Yeah. Is that the, yeah, just a great movie. Yeah. Uh, oh, back to me. So my next one, um, cheesy, everything else. I, it was never released in theaters, I don't think, but it was called Love at For First Sight uh, yep. with Haley R Lou Richardson. Uh, and I think it's Ben Hardy. I think that's his name. Um, and, you know, basically there are two people who both miss their flight, they get put on another flight to England, <clears throat> you know, everything happens, you know, they end up, you know, sitting next to each other. And it, so you know, again, you know where it's going, but it's the acting and just some of the story, there's a few twists in there that you don't expect. Um, the, some of the other actors who are in it, particularly when they get to England, are great. And some of them, like, you look at their credentials, you know, they've done Broadway, they've done, you know, um, English theater, everything else. They've been in all, all these movies. So that just really adds to it. Yep. Um, I would say it's definitely, you know, don't, <laughs> don't expect, oh, it's Oppenheimer. But if you want to just sit down and watch a nice rom-com, 
A hundred percent. I would watch that. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, I do love a good rom-com. And the, the rom romantic comedies get a bad rap. They do. Uh, Absolutely. And when you have a good one, it's, 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 like, it's, it's, it's just pure joy. When yeah. you have a good one, <laughs> it's pure escapism, and it just makes you feel good. Yeah. And there's another one which I forgot now, which is very similar with Angori Rice um, and uh, Gaten Matano. And I'm drawing a blank. And it's a, like honor student or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I think that's or honor uh, society. Honor society, like good twist in that. And yeah. again, just a, a nice movie just to sit and watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then my number seven is uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Interesting. Uh, I am a, I am a Marvel fan. Yeah. Uh, and this is by far there were three theatrical released Marvel movies. This is by far the best one. Of the and, year. Of the year. Yeah. And uh, I'm a big fan of the Guardians of the Galaxy within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think they're the strongest, some, among the strongest films because they are character driven instead of plot driven. Yep. And it really dives into who these characters are, why these characters are. And this one gets into the backstory, the very tragic backstory of Rocket Raccoon. Right. And it doesn't shy away from showing some, some very hard visuals. Yep. And it's kind of surprising for a $200 million superhero film to go where it goes. Yeah. Because these are hard emotions and it doesn't shy away. And I was kind of taken aback by how moving the movie actually was. Yeah. And it was, it was almost on my list. Um, one and two uh, are my two favorite Marvel movies. Okay. Um, and the only thing about Guardians 3, it just became bloated with so many different characters. That's what's so great about the first one. It's a very small movie. Yeah. The second one, um, and I go back and forth, which is my favorite, the first yeah. and the second. The second one, if you, it's, it's deep. That yeah. one is you know, unbelievably deep. Yeah, the so, father-son dynamic in that is Yeah, so the only complex. thing about it, I, I think it just became bloated, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and so it was a it was a bubbling under um, because I love Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. No, I, I I understand that it is, and I've and, watched those tons of times. And I understand that because and that was actually one of my big criticisms with movies this year, uh, not this year, last year, uh, was length. Too many films were like <laughs> yeah. way way too long. Right. Uh, that one was just on the cusp for me of being like, okay, it's not feeling too long, but I can understand how it could be too long for some people. Right. Yeah. All righty, so next for me, um, uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Okay. Um, in terms of, I love a good action movie. You know, I won't count Fast 6 and Fast and Furious, but they're fun, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least these ones are smart. Yep. Um, and so well done. The characters have been defined. What's great is that Tom Cruise is no longer the star of the movie. It's everybody else. He's right. still in it. There, were, there was a scene, there was a section of him going, what happened to Tom Cruise, yeah. you know? Which is what it should be. Mission Which Impossible is, is always an ensemble. Absolutely. You know, unfortunately, you know, they introduced some new characters. You lost some favorite characters in it. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I thought the ending was unbelievable because they, you know, it's part one. Yeah. So it's like, oh, it's going to end like that. It didn't. It yeah. throws you for a loop with the ending in a good way. Um, and I just, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, I've watched all the Fast and Furious. Yeah. And it's just like, what what absurd thing are you going to throw at me? Yep. But they've actually tamed it down a little. There's a couple things where you're like, yeah, you can't do that. But they're still on the believable side. Yeah. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. And I like, like I said, I liked all the people, the, you know, all real um, effects, like when they're in the car, and yeah. they're handcuffed together driving this car. That's yep. all real. Yeah. That's not CGI. Yeah. And they're, because there's always at least one absolutely insane stunt yeah that Mike uh, that, that uh Tom Cruise does and it is it's him driving a, a bike off this cliff yeah. and it's insane but he did it when he and he they did that like 15 times I know, because <laughs> so, they had to get the shot right right and there's also uh a, a, an insane sequence with a runaway train oh the train stuff is is, is, is great is phenomenal yeah, I, so I didn't put it on my list uh just because this was a film I, where I was kind of feeling the length. And it was, because it's 2.45, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's a long one. It's yeah. a long one, and I was like, does this need to be two parts? This just feels a little bit gratuitous. <laughs> well, if it had been one part, it would have been a, I a know. very long movie. So. There were some things in there where I... Oh, I, they could have definitely cut... Like, there was one scene uh, in a club that was basically exposition dump the scene. 
and it went for like 10 minutes. And I was like, you know, I don't really need to know why you're doing the things you're doing. It's always yeah. just a MacGuffin in these movies. Right. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter what they're trying to do. It's just you want them to succeed. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so my number six is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. I haven't seen that. Uh, I am a, a big Ninja Turtles fan. Uh, so I'm not going to say this was on here by default because there have been Ninja Turtles films I did not like. But this one, uh, you can even see in that visual there, uh, the animation is done in a style that is kind of like the doodles that you would do on your notebook <laughs> as a kid. So the lines aren't perfect. Yeah. It is CG, but it's done in a way that looks hand-drawn. And so the explosions will have like little like scri like scribbly lines yeah. for the, the puffs oh, and everything. Cool. And so it's just, the, visually it's very cool looking. And it's also the first time the characters have actually been performed by teenagers. Like, crazy <laughs> yeah. idea. Uh, and they feel like teenagers and they were all recorded together. So, and they were allowed to improvise. So they're talking over each other. Nice. They're making fun of each other. So it's kind of the first time that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have actually felt like teenagers. Yep. And so that's fun. You have Jackie Chan as Splinter, and he's kind of portrayed as this uh, overbearing father instead of like the ninja master. And it's just a lot of fun. Oh. And I think it's one of the, those films that even if you're not familiar with these characters, you could get into it. Yeah. No, it sounds like I, I, uh, I'd like to watch that. All right. Um, number five, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor yep. Among yep. Thieves. Again, you know, and I don't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons at all, the, the plot line of it, but just an enjoyable movie. Just you sit there and it's fun. I mean, there's, you know, action, action, romance, love. The closest movie I would relate it to would be The Princess Bride. Mm -hmm. um, the characters are all great in it. Everybody, the, you know, the, uh, the characterizations and how they did it. Hugh Grant is just, you know, playing Hugh Grant, but he's great. Um, and just again, just a fun movie to watch and and enjoy. Yeah. Um, and you know, you don't go. In, I didn't go in with any pretexts because I didn't know about the game. I don't know how it works. I know how it works, but um, and they just they did it very well. And there's a nice arc of stories and connections with people. Yeah. Um, it it was definitely a, a fun movie to go see. Yeah. It was almost on my list. It is. It is an incredibly a fun, mil fun, fun film, like you just said. Like, and I'm kind of surprised we haven't gotten more Dungeons and Dragons movies. Right. Because it's perfectly set for films because it's all about your the different guilds of characters. Yeah. And they're already very clearly defined who these characters are, and you can just plop them in to an adventure because the the game itself doesn't have a plot. It's right. whoever the master creates the plot, so you can literally do anything. And I think it's because there was a terrible, terrible Dungeons and Dragons movie that came out in 2000 that kind of killed any idea right. of there. But now this one did pretty well and it was well liked, and so maybe we'll get some more. Because I would, Chris Pine is hilarious. I would in love this to movie. see a sequel to it. You know, everybody in it was, it just was, it was enjoyable. Yeah. And uh, and you know, just the 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 mood of it. Like I said, the closest thing to related to me is is Princess Bride. Yeah. And how do you ever fault Princess Bride? Right. So. Uh, let's see my. Oh yeah, cracking into the top five now. That's ooh. Uh, my number five is Wonka. I Interesting. was hesitant about this because the idea of a prequel to Wonka, like the cynic in me was like, no, that's a terrible idea. Uh, but uh, it's directed by Peter King, who did, or Paul King, uh, I think his name is, uh, who did the Paddington movies. And I adore the oh, Paddington oh, movies. They're so good. And I, I don't know why it's this new thing with Hollywood. They don't advertise musicals as being musicals. Wonka, <laughs> Wonka is a full musical. Is it really? With, See, I didn't even know. I, I thought exactly. it had a few songs. No, it's a full musical, original musical. The only song they bring over is uh, Pure Imagination. Yeah. Uh, but everything else is a 100% a, a original musical. And the songs are great. It's got this uh, very screwball, whimsical sense of humor. Uh, a real sense of wonder and magic and awe, and it is just delightful. I'll, I'll have to give it a shot because I, you know, I heard, you know, some positive stuff. I heard some negative stuff. It's still playing in the theater here. Yeah, I know. Um, and you know, Timothy Chalamet can do no wrong in my book. Yeah, I mean, he's just always good. And uh, so I'll have to, I'll have to give it because I, you know, the original one. I that was the first book I ever read as a kid. You know, of like of of some sub substance. 
um, was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So I should give it and that. I, and I know it's not based off of those books, but it's still that. It's still that, within the, the universe. Spirit, yeah. And I kind of had to a little, a little bit detach from it because it is Willy Wonka. But if you're trying to like line it up 100% with the book or 100% with the movie, it's kind of its own entity. But as that, as just like this random chocolatier that just happens to be named Willy Wonka, it's really charming. That's a good way to look at it. I, you know, I was not a fan of the Johnny Depp version. No. There was one hysterical joke in it. Other than that, I thought it was, you know, you know, the original one, you know, um, uh, whatever it's called, the one with Gene Wilder. Yeah. I can't even remember. There's so many of them. Um, you know, there is, that's a dark movie. Yeah. There are some things in there that are, yeah. you know, and as an adult, when you watch it now going, <laughs> yeah, and this, this is not dark at all. This oh, is a light, okay. whimsical, fun movie. And on that basis, it, it's, it, it's very charming. Cool. All right, I will uh, put that on my list too. Um, number four, again, another one that I saw recently that, in my opinion, you know, should have been up for Oscars and everything else was The Iron Claw. Oh, I didn't. With uh, yeah. Zac Efron. I didn't see that, um, but it was on my list to watch. Uh, uh, what, uh, Jeremy Allen White. Um, amazing movie. My son saw it first, and he just, he loved it. Um, and it's a movie about brothers, and so I really understand why my son liked it. There were elements of it that, you know, if you have brothers or whatever, you're going to connect with those things with it. Um, you know, the story is amazing. It's a true story. Um, filmed in a great way, you know, because it takes place in the 80s or whatever. Um, so, you know, subdued tones and everything yeah. else. Um, you know, probably not a bad note in it. Uh, and very, very enjoyable. And, and you know, emotional it, yeah. and sad, happy and sad. Um, so it definitely is. Uh, and I don't understand why, you know, even if it got kind of an aside nomination for music or, you know, background noise or whatever, um, it just, uh, it's, it's a great movie. I uh, feel like a lot of times with the Academy, uh, they lean towards their Oscar worthy movies. <laughs> the four that I gave yeah. at, the, at uh, the beginning. And I haven't seen that yet, but I've heard the acting is very good. Uh, but it's also about wrestling. And obviously there was the wrestler that did get nominations, but that, right. that was kind of an anomaly. Uh, and it was also, that was done by a prestige director. Right. So. Uh, I, I think part of it might have been the subject matter, like, oh well, that's yeah, that's and, we don't do that. Wrestling is fake and everything else, but yeah. but you, know, you watch this movie, it's like it's not that fake. It is fake, but the, what, you know, what they're doing is not fake. No, like, they're athletic. It's scripted. Yeah, it's but scripted, it's, but yeah. oh, I watch some of that stuff. And go, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't last a minute in the ring. Uh, so my number four, and there was some debate on how I phrased this movie. Uh, I'm gonna call it Richards the Musical. But it, it, it's oh, not. Oh, I haven't. I yeah. wanted to watch that. I've heard that that is is just a fun movie. Uh, so this was one of the best movie going experiences I had last year. Did you I, see it in a theater? I didn't see it in oh, a theater, no. but I had a big group of people come over and we watched it together. And this is so outrageous and so crass and so <laughs> vulgar. That's what I've heard. That watching it with a big group was an experience because it is genuinely shocking at times but in a good way yeah uh it is essentially the parent trap with two adult men and it's yeah. the parents are megan mullally and nathan lane and you really can't go wrong with that right and so what i've been saying because the fun popular thing to say right now because everyone's so obsessed with oh it's so pc you can't be funny anymore is to say oh, you could never make a movie like Blazing Saddles today. Uh, this movie proves that wrong because it crosses so many lines. By the end, you're kind of uh, applauding something that you're like, wait a second. <laughs> that's grossly inappropriate, but good for them? <laughs> yeah, but it's a movie, and that's what you, yeah. it's part of that experience. You know, you can't go out on the street and go to Starbucks and start behaving that way. Yeah. But you can in a movie, and right. that's and you know, and I have, I've heard, I've heard great things about that. And so. I think part of it because it goes to an extreme at the end, and I think part of the point of it is that extreme is basically how conservatives perceive the LGBTQ yeah. community. So they take it to an extreme. They take it to the extreme that they like. Oh, this is what you think our community is. Okay, well here it is. <laughs> that's awesome. 
All right. Um, so the next one, another Michael Fassbender movie, Next Goal Wins, which is oh, a Taika Waititi movie. I haven't watched it yet. I um, love Taika. My though. son had uh, said, you got to watch, you got to watch, you got to watch it. And, then we, and we couldn't get it on streaming. And we all watched it um, when we were together a month ago. And a great movie. Again, another true story. I seem to have a theme with mine. <laughs> um, another, but, but very subtle. To be honest, one of the best things about it is Taika Waititi is just a... A tiny character in it because mm. um, he can be over the top. He's a great um, scene stealer, though. He's a great scene stealer, but just a fun movie and a couple of things at the very beginning when this person has to go through the seven stages of grief is hysterical. And it just is, again, just a nice movie. Um, and, and it's Michael Fassbender basically becoming a coach for an, a, a losing team. Right. He was a, you know, a prominent um, soccer coach, then had some on field problems. And they're like, here, this is your last chance. Go to have this team. And, and it's great because it, it, it makes sense. You know, it's not like, oh, yeah, that would never happen. This team could never achieve this. Oh, it's because of this coach. No, it's all just about, you know, it's about heart, if you want to say. And, and, you know, really funny. <laughs> There's great things about the, the speed limit in, New, uh, they're not in New Zealand. I can't remember the country. Um, and it's just, again, another fun movie, you know, Great family movie just to sit down and watch. You know, everybody would get something from it. Yeah. Uh, that's on my list. I love Taika Waititi. I think he's a really great and unique director. I love his voice as a filmmaker. So that yeah. is on my list of something to watch. Yeah, the uh, uh, the one three years ago. What was it? The Hitler one. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Jojo Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit. One of, that's, that would probably be my top ten movies of all time. Yeah. Uh, so my number three is one of those movies. The holdover. The hold, there you go. Uh, I, this I knew this would be on people's list. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I this movie. I I watched it in anticipation of the Academy Awards, and it really kind of just snuck up on me. Uh, I like the intimacy of it. I like that it is like I was saying about Guardians of the Galaxy. It's character driven. There isn't really a plot. Right. Uh, right. Which is fine. I'm fine with that. And it it kind of. It does have a, fam a, a, a familiar trope with the idea of sort of this curmudgeon guy and this uh, kind of little punk kid. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, you know, they're going to make each other better. And they do, but, but they, they don't. don't. <laughs> right. And they learn lessons, but they don't. And the way they learn those lessons, the way they become better, it's subtle, and I appreciate that subtlety. Paul Giamatti is brilliant. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of performance I wish would win Best Actor. Oppenheimer... It's a great performance that Killian Murphy does, but it's that thing that the Academy loves so much of, it's a showy performance in the sense that, oh, well, he's performing somebody else, and we have a reference point so we right. can say, look how he's doing such a good job of being that person, where you have somebody like Paul Giamatti playing a character that we all know, that sort oh, of yeah. guy that yeah. is so smart, but he has no social skills, and he kind of pushes everybody away. We all know a person like that, and yeah. he nails that so well. I think if it, it's a type of movie, I, I wish I'd seen it in the theater, mm -hmm. and I wish I'd seen it before I heard anything about it. Yeah. Because by the time I saw it, oh, this is great, Paul Giamatti is great, oh, the, you know, so it kind of had reached that point where if I had just walked in sight unseen, I probably, it probably would have been on the list. Yeah. Um, you know, the scenes, no spoiler, the stuff in Boston, yeah. I thought it was phenomenal. Yeah. I loved what they did with that. Um, you know, and the visuals, because again, they filmed it like a, even the opening credits. Yeah. You know, they use the old logo. Um, so it looks like a 1970s movie. And they do a good job of, of not even making it look like, but actually having the, the pace and the tone exactly. yeah. of that era. And I was really happy to see uh, Devane uh, Joy Randolph win Best yeah. Supporting Actress because she gives a really good performance of the, the cook of this private school. Uh, who's grieving the loss of her son from Vietnam, and it's a very good performance, and I was happy to yeah. see that win. Yeah. So I mean, it's that's kind of you know the you know the bub again the bubbling under, um, again one of those things that you know it's you hear so much, you know, and maybe it's you know something I visit revisit in a year, and I'll go, this is really good. I think because it, it is the subtleness. Yeah, and it is set around Christmas, so I do think it could kind of be sort of a quirky alternative yep. movie to watch around Christmas time. And maybe that's when you revisit it, and maybe it'll just strike you as like, oh, this is actually a really nice, warm right. movie for the holiday. There you go. Yeah. Um, all right, so number two, um, uh, you know, kind of should it be number one, should it be number two, is Barbie. Okay. I loved Barbie. I thought everything about it, um, 
you know, and I, the one thing, you know, I love the fact that, you know, you could take your six year old kid to it and they would enjoy it because they wouldn't get some of the stuff, but we can watch it on all those things. I think the, uh, um, you know, the, the girl power element of it was great. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Gosling, unbelievable. Um, a shout out to Michael Sarah. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, oh, Alan. I love uh, Alan. I'm and Alan. I'm just, uh, I might as well talk about it now, too, because it, it is my number one. It is the movie that I absolutely loved beyond every other. It's one of those rare movies that I think that was like an instant, people say this all the time, like instant classic. Yeah, like, this absolutely. is a movie that in 10 years, people are still going to be watching and it's going to have a huge impact. Yeah. No, and I think that just all the visuals, um, everything about it, um, and just, you know, funny little little elements of yeah. it. Um, I, I really, you know, in the, and the I'm just Ken in the movie, yeah. it's just, you talk about a show stopper yep. or a movie stopper. And e even to the end, I did not see that coming. The oh, yeah. very end scene, but love that. And I love what they did with it. Um, so no, it was, it was one of those that I left the theater, you know, if you could say, you know, cheering, I wasn't cheering, but that's yeah. the way I felt because it just was, um, everything about it. Yeah, and it's one of those movies that shouldn't be good by all intents oh, and purposes. It's a movie based on a toy. And the fact that Warner Brothers spent like a hundred million dollars to make a movie that is very weird, very at times surreal and yeah. quirky, this could have been the safest, most banal movie imaginable. And they actually made a pretty risky movie right. with a strong message. Uh, and even though it is quote unquote, a message movie, it's also very, very funny. Yeah. And that's the way you, to, to like put a message. If you kind of like couch it within, some, within comedy, you can get your message across in a more meaningful way. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're crossing the two worlds, the our world and the Barbie world, and they did it in a good way. It's not, it wasn't like, that's what makes it, it almost like you would expect it to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And every, you know, everybody in it, Margot Robbie was phenomenal as Barbie, so. Yeah, and just all as of the. As one Barbie, not Yeah, really. and yeah. all of the other Barbies and Kens that are just in the background, and sometimes they only have one or two lines, but they're all with cast yeah. by really great actors. Right, and Alan. And Alan, I love Alan. <laughs> I have a couple Alan shirts. Oh yeah, he just said love. <laughs> Uh, so that's my number one. So I'll do my uh, my number two. Uh, my number two is Cocaine Bear, which I will not defend as being you know, a great movie. You've talked about this before yeah. about well, and I have a movie to tie in with Cocaine yeah. Bear. Go ahead with that. Uh, I will not defend this as being a great movie, and it's one of those like based on a true story movies, right? Where it's like the true story is that yes, a bear found some cocaine that a drug trafficker threw out an airplane. He ate it, died instantly <laughs> because of course right. he did. But this is also sort of like his redemption story. Uh, it's directed by Elizabeth Banks, so it's got a comedic feel. But it's like, yeah. well, what if that bear just went on a rampage? And it's has the perfect tone. It's not a horror movie, but it's got you know campy gore. It has just the perfect tone of like be campy fun. Yeah, and I loved it. And well, it's also Ray Liotta's last movie. Right. <laughs> and, and to go along with that is one of my favorite movies from the year before. If this had been this year, I would have added to it, was um, Violent Night, which is yes. a Santa Claus yep. movie, which is just, I saw it, I think, four times in the theater because yeah. I kept taking different people. Great movie. And if you kind of look at the story, it could be a Hallmark Channel movie. Oh, yeah. And David Harbour as Santa Claus, he's a, you know, He's a Santa Claus is just kind of I've been Santa Claus for a long time and you know then he helps his family you know who are being held hostage by bad guys but it's great and there's funny things in this stuff with the reindeer I mean easily one of my favorite movies yeah um, and very similar to that feel yeah so yeah but I I, I, I love that movie uh, yeah you, you talk about you know when you talk about acting Academy Award things um, if you look at, at Violent Night, David Harbour held that entire movie, and that was acting. I mean, yeah. what he did in that movie. So, All right, so my, uh, my favorite movie, which Barbie would have been had this not come out, but I saw this um, a couple months ago, and I heard about it, and I said, this, this is interesting. I really want to see this. Went to see it in the theater. There was only about 25 people in the theater. Um, and from the minute the movie started, um, no lie. From the minute the movie started, it starts at the opening. You're like, "Is this the movie? Are we into it?" There was not a sound in that theater until the end of the movie. Nobody crumpled popcorn. Nobody rustled mm. in their seats. 
Um, and part of it is because of what it's about, and that is the zone of interest. Oh, I um, haven't seen this yet. Unbelievable. And you know, basically it's about the commandant of Auschwitz and his family who live in the house next to Auschwitz. Mm. But it's never discussed what's happening in Auschwitz. You never see what's happening. But it's next door. There's some visuals. There's sound. The sound in it was amazing. It won Best Sound for an Oscar. Right. It won Best Foreign Film. And it just... And the way they filmed it, they did a lot of like you know cameras that were just placed around. So when somebody's going up the stairs, it's all one shot and everything right. else. Um, and you know it's a horrible, horrible, horrible time in our world. Um, and it it doesn't make light of it. It's none of that. Um, it just is. It's a, you know you call it a slice of life or whatever. But easily one of the best movies I've ever seen mm. because of how they did it. It could have been. It could have been terrible. But again, because, you know, this is a family living their everyday life, which is not a life that we want to be part of, right. but they're living their life. And um, I just, I was, I was blown away by the movie. Yeah. And no, no music in the movie except for some incidental music. Mm -hmm. And that was part of it. Again, you're just, you're sitting there for however long the movie was and um, you can't, you're like, where is this going? What, you know, and it doesn't go you know it's you know starts here it ends here um it doesn't go to 1945 or anything like right. that and yeah that was one of those ones that I, I didn't quite catch i was trying to sort of catch up on all of the oscar nominated movies and that just wasn't one of the ones i quite got to uh i wanted to see it but yeah. i just didn't get and a it, you know and it's one of those things you gotta you gotta settle in in a quiet spot you know yeah. hopefully on the biggest screen you have um, you know, it's something, you know, don't plan to get up and get snacks or anything like that. Just, just take it in. Um, right. Don't, I, don't have your phone out fiddling on it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, so that's, uh, that's my list of, uh, of the 10 best. And it was interesting going through, trying to find these movies, a couple, you know, you know, came up right away, you know, um, you know, like my top four, you know, Zone of Interest, Barbie, Nick Cohen. I knew those were going to be in my list but then kind of looking back and remembering you know when i saw no i was like what is no hard and then i remembered yeah. i really enjoyed no hard feelings yeah I, I thought i was gonna have a hard time coming up with my list because a lot of the big big movies this year were kind of duds yeah like indiana jones five it was fine i wanted to put but i was like eh, it was fine right it was uh, fine. like john wick four really good but it was one of those things where it's like did it need to be three hours long not no, really not, not really all. uh but that's the thing, but I could have done another list of 10 very easily. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting that with the exception of the holdovers, um, you didn't have Killers of the Flower Moon, no. American Fiction. Did you have American Fiction? I didn't have American yeah. Fiction. Um, Oppenheimer, Poor Things. And those are the movies that people kind of throw at you. You yeah. know, that this is what you have to enjoy. Right. Um, uh, Oppenheimer and, and Poor Things were just kind of bubbling there. Because I did like Oppenheimer, and I didn't have a problem with the structure of it, and I was able to follow it. Poor things, uh, I did like Emma. Uh, I thought Emma Stone's she was performance great. was amazing. She was great, and the tone the... of it is very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of gratuitous sex uh, that probably could have been cut back, but I right. think that's also kind of the point: is to make you uncomfortable yeah. because so much of it is about how the world perceives women's autonomy and like, oh, well, a woman can't act that way. Right. And so I feel like it's forcing you to look at that and make you uncomfortable, but then that doesn't necessarily make it a good experience. Yeah. And I've always been, you know, I, you know, there are big movies I love. Um, but you know, I, when, when I was a kid, we went to the movies probably every weekend. And this was when we were watching the sting and the Godfather and yeah. dog day afternoon and Serpico and all these movies. And so I really got a feel for a lot of, you know, quieter movies. Yeah. You know, there are movie suit that I just watch and I'm like, that was great. And it, and then you're like, have you heard this movie? Have you heard of this movie? Have you heard it? Nobody has. Right. Um, and so I think that's part of it. I think all of those were also presented. You know, Killers of the Flower Moon had some great, great elements to it. Um, I th you know, again, Jesse Plemons, who's always good in everything. I felt that, um, and I, I apologize for not getting her name, um, the lead actress. You talk about a subtle, too subtle. You know, yeah. that's why she was not going to win the Oscar, because yeah. it was, but it was so good. Yeah. Because she carries the whole movie so subtly. Yeah. Um, and, and I like that. I like movies where you can just kind of go, that was a great movie. Yeah. And I, that's kind of why I included the holdovers, because it, it was a movie that you can lean back and kind of just enjoy and just be like, oh, this is a nice, 
quiet movie. Right. And that, of all of these, um, I would probably revisit The Holdovers yeah. because I'd want to see, again, you know, you know, it's the vibe thing. What was, what was my mood that night? Yeah. Uh, we need to do need to wrap this oh, up. Yeah, one, no one, one movie that uh, I did watch that was in the, the 10 that were nominated for Best Picture that didn't get talked about a lot, and I wouldn't necessarily put it on my 10 best list, but it was a nice small movie, was Past Lives. Yeah, I did, my wife saw that. I didn't get a chance to see uh, that. And she it's really just liked it. This really nice, again, character driven story of, of people just living and interacting and how they connect. And I like small little intimate stories like that. So I was happy that it got nominated in the top 10 because one of the good things about being nominated for Best Picture, even if you're not going to win, is that it puts and people, like, uh, puts it on people's map. Right. Which, and again, I, with, with this list, we, I think we both try to pick movies that right. are not necessarily. They're, yeah, they're ones that I want to you know, see off of your list. And, uh, and I like that they have the 10 movies for that reason. So it's not just the blockbusters. It's yeah. seeing it. Now, a little spoiler alert. You know, I guarantee you, if we do this again next year on this list, we'll be Dune 2. Okay. Dune Part 2. So. I still haven't watched Dune 2 because I, I had a hard time getting into the first one. I watched it again. Yeah. Then saw Dune Part 2, the, like the next night or two nights later. Um, and uh, really, really enjoyed Again, just because of it's not an overblown movie. All right. So the, that's a preview of a next, preview of next the, year. Of next year. See All us right. next March. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So come back and get Lost Movies again.